Okay, so before we get into the new stuff for today, I just wanted to do a quick recap of the stuff that we went over in the first part of section 8.2. So if you guys remember, we started learning about how to do hypothesis testing for a mean. Okay, so all of the questions that we looked at dealt with means or averages. And specifically, we were looking at the cases where the population standard deviation is known. So in other words, they give it to you in the question. Okay, now when the population standard deviation is known and you're testing for a mean, both of those things together tell you that you're going to use a z-test to decide your answer. Okay, now there are two widely used and accepted methods in the world of statistics for how to uh, complete the z-test, and the first one that we looked at was called the traditional method. Okay, so the traditional method had those five steps, so let's just recap those. So step one, we stated the hypotheses and labeled the claim. Step two was where we found the critical value, which you can get um, by looking at that list of the common critical values that I gave you in your notes. Step three was to find the test value or test statistic or Z value. All of those are names for the exact same thing. Um, and you get that by using that formula that's in your notes from that section. And then step four, that's where you draw your normal distribution curve and then you label your critical value and your rejections, um, rejection region and you look at whether or not that Z value falls in the rejection region. If it does, then you're gonna decide to reject the null. If it doesn't, then you don't reject the null. And then step five is where you make your um, summary statement or your conclusion about your results. So that's always going to come from that table where it has those four possible answers that you'll say as far as whether you um, found enough evidence to support the claim or you didn't find enough evidence um, to either support or reject the claim. Okay, so uh, what we're going to look at today is the second method for how you complete a z-test. Okay, so this method is called the p-value method. The P stands for probability. So when we're finding P values, what we're really doing is we're finding a probability. And it's the probability of getting a sample statistic or a more extreme one in the direction of the alternative hypothesis, assuming that the null hypothesis is true. So I'll kind of explain a little bit more what that means in just a second. Um, for now, I'm just gonna give you the layout of the four steps that you use for the p-value method. So step one, is exactly the same as the first step in the traditional method. So you're going to state your hypotheses and identify which one is the claim. So uh, nothing is different there at all. Step two is where you're going to find your p-value. So the p-value method kind of came into play once technology advanced and we were able to use technology to quickly get the probability or the p-value. So the p-value method, we're just gonna get from, um, or the p-value I should say, we're just gonna get from our graphing calculators. So if you wanna make a note, the place that you're gonna go in your calculator to get the p-value, uh, you'll click stat, you'll go over to tests, and then it's the one right at the very top. So it's number one and it's called the z-test. Okay, and just to make another note in our notes, um, we use the z-test when sigma is known. Okay, we will have another test when sigma is unknown. And then your rounding rule uh, for your p-value, since it's a probability, we're gonna round everything for all p-values to four decimal places. Okay, so step three then is where you make your decision. Okay, so um, your decision-making process is a little bit different here. So now what we're going to do in this method is we're going to compare the p-value with alpha. So if your p-value is less than or equal to alpha, then you're going to reject the null hypothesis. And if your p-value is greater than alpha, you are um, not going to reject the null hypothesis. So even though these we have two different methods for doing this z-test, they're really figuring out the same thing. So I just wanna show you a quick illustration so you can kind of understand what's actually going on here. So last class when we were um, looking at the traditional method, what we did when we drew our curve was we labeled the critical value. So we put that on our curve and then 
we went ahead and we labeled um, or shaded our rejection region, okay, which was based off of alpha. So alpha is the area in the tail um, that goes in the direction of the alternative hypothesis. Okay, so your alpha um, basically determines what your rejection region is. Now, with that method, you would be looking for then whether or not your Z value fell into the rejection region or not. And that would tell you whether you should reject the null or not reject the null. What we're going to do here is actually look at the, the area underneath the curve. So your p-value, remember p-value is a probability, and if you remember from chapter 6, a probability is telling you the area underneath the curve. So for example, you might have a p-value, um, if it's smaller than alpha, it might look like that on your curve. So your p-value is just indicating the area underneath the curve. So if your p-value is smaller than alpha, then that's automatically telling you that your z-value must be in the rejection zone or rejection region. So there's no other way to draw that. So if your p-value represents a smaller area than the area that alpha represents, then it must be the case that your z um, is in the rejection region, which tells you that you should reject the null hypothesis. Okay, the other way it can happen is if your um, p-value represents a larger area than alpha, then obviously your z-value would be outside of that rejection region, and that would tell you that you do not reject the null hypothesis. So even though they're two different methods, they're actually, I mean, they're using the exact same concepts. We're kind of just looking at two different parts of your curve there. Okay, so what you want to remember, though, if you're going to take anything away from all of that, um, is just what's in that little, um, this blue box here. So if your p-value is less than or equal to alpha, that tells you that you should reject the null hypothesis. And if your p-value is greater than alpha, then you do not reject the null hypothesis. Okay, and then step four is the exact same as step five from the traditional method. So um, this is the exact same box that I gave you um, in the notes there. So nothing's different. You'll just determine where your claim is, figure out your decision, and then you'll make one of these four statements at the end of your hypothesis test. Okay, so let's do a couple examples. So example one says, um, a researcher wishes to test the claim that the average cost of tuition and fees at a four-year public college is greater than 5,700. She selects a random sample of 36 four-year public colleges and finds the mean to be 5,950. The population standard deviation is 659. Is there evidence to support the claim at alpha equals 0 0.05? Use the p-value method. Okay, so step one, we are going to state our hypotheses. So if you remember, the null hypothesis is where you're always going to use an equal to sign. Okay, so um, we're trying to determine whether the, the average cost is greater than 5,700. So for the null, I'm going to put that mu equals 5,700. Okay, and then in my alternative, I'll go ahead and I'll put the claim. So for that one, I'll say that mu is greater than 5,700. And then make sure you identify which one is the claim. So actually write that down on your paper. Okay, step two is where we're actually going to uh, get the p-value. Okay, now just real quick, I know it's obvious that we're using a z-test because we're learning about the z-test in this section, but we're gonna learn about multiple tests this chapter. So you do wanna start to get comfortable identifying when you actually use a z-test. So the key in this question is two things. One is that you're talking about averages, and then specifically, we are given the population standard deviation. Okay, so those two things together tell me that I should use a z-test. Okay, and then it says to use the p-value method, so that basically means pick up your calculator and your calculator is going to do most of the work here for you. Okay, so in your calculator, you're gonna, going to go to z-test, so you'll click, um, let me grab mine, you'll click stat, 
and then go over to tests and then like I said it's the top one so just click enter on Z test okay and then um, you might be on stats already so if stats is blinking great if it's not then move your arrow over to stats and click enter okay and it's going to generate a new list of um, parameters for you to fill out. Okay, so let's fill everything out here. So mu not, it's basically just asking what mu is, so that's the 5700. Um, sigma is obviously the population standard deviation, so type in 659 there. Uh, X bar means that it wants the mean of the sample, so in the question it said that the mean of the sample was 5950, so type that in for X bar. And then it also wants N, so N is the number of colleges in the sample, so N is 36. And then you do have to tell your calculator um, the direction of the sign in the alternative hypothesis. Okay, so uh, move your cursor over, or your cursor, move your arrow over to the greater than mu naught, and make sure you click enter. So then it actually starts like blinking on top of that one. Okay, so you have to be really careful when you're filling these out that you don't kind of skip over that part because if you put the wrong sign um, into your calculator, you'll definitely get the wrong answer. So um, just watch out for that. Okay, and then don't worry about the color. Um, we're not gonna draw it. Just go over to calculate and click enter. And then uh, mine gives me a list of five things under the Z test and you'll notice the third one down if yours is the same as mine um, is a lowercase p and that is your p-value so we'll go ahead and we will round that to four decimal places so you should get 0 0.0114 okay so that's our p-value now step three what we want to do is compare the p-value with alpha Okay, so I always kind of do this in the same way. So I always jot down my p-value first, alpha second. Okay, so 0 0.0114 and 0 0.05. And then you just want to figure out what inequality sign should go in there. So you have two options. It can either be a less than or equal to sign or a greater than sign. So obviously 0 0.0114 is less than 0 0.05, so that's the less than or equal to case. Okay, so uh, from that box in your notes there, you can see that when P is less than or equal to alpha, that tells you that you should reject the null. And then for step four, we'll just make our conclusion statement here. So since the claim is in the alternative hypothesis and we're rejecting the null hypothesis the way I kind of think about it to make sense of it is that if we're rejecting the null then that means we're throwing our support into the alternative so we'll say that there is enough evidence to support the claim okay and if that doesn't make all that much sense to you right now that's okay you'll certainly get a lot more practice with it um, in the next few weeks so for now just kind of look at that box and um, use that to help you figure out what your summary statement should be okay let's do one more example so example two says that a researcher claims that the average wind speed in a certain city is eight miles per hour a sample of 32 days has an average wind speed of 8.2 miles per hour. The standard deviation of the population is 0.6 miles per hour. Uh, alpha is 0.05. Is there enough evidence to reject the claim? Okay, so step one, we're going to state our hypotheses. So our null hypothesis. Um, let's see. So it says researcher claims that the average, blah, 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 is 8 miles per hour. So I'm going to say that mu equals 8. Okay, now specifically as I was reading that, it says a researcher claims that the average wind speed is 8 miles per hour. Okay, so is algebraically means equals 8. Okay, so that actually is the claim. So I'm not sure if we've seen that. 
yet where the claim is actually in the null, but this is an example of that. Okay, so if you're looking at whether or not your average is exactly equal to a certain value, then your claim will be in the null hypothesis. And then for your alternative, what you want to do is just put the opposite. Okay, so for H1, we're going to say that mu is not equal to 8. Okay, step 2 is where we find our p-value. Okay, so again, I'm just going to kind of note how we know what test to use, and it's because they give us in the question uh, the population standard deviation, so that tells us to use z-test. So in your calculator, you will go to z-test, and then you're just going to fill everything out again, just like the last one. So let's see, your mu naught should be equal to 8. Sigma is 0.6. X bar is 8.2. N is 32. And then make sure you highlight the not equal to mu naught. And then go to calculate and round your p-value off to four decimal places and you should get 0 0.0593. Okay, so hopefully you were able to get that. And then step three, we just have to compare our p-value with alpha. Okay, so we'll say that since our p-value and then we're going to compare it with 0 0.05. So let's see, um, 0 0.0593 is obviously larger than 0 0.05. So I'm going to fill in a greater than sign there. So since P is greater than alpha, that tells us that we do not reject the null hypothesis. And then step four, we've got to make our summary statement. So here, the claim is the null hypothesis, and we're not rejecting the null hypothesis. So hopefully this one makes sense. We say that there is not enough evidence to reject the claim.